have uh, just a big jump slide water slide in the back for the for the children. Hope you'll let them stay and have a good time out back. And there's going to be uh, food in the fellowship hall immediately following the service. Appreciate all of you that helped and uh, prepared and bring working uh, before service and some of you during Sunday school to make it possible. We appreciate that. And uh, we'll be dismissing our service tonight because uh, most of us will be spending the majority of the day here at the church. So, uh, amen. Just pray you'll have a, a blessed day and that you'll spend a good portion of it here with us uh, at Bible Way. Know that we love you. And uh, if you do have to travel today, uh, I pray safety over you because the roads are absolutely crazy. I flew into Pensacola uh, yesterday. It looked like uh, Dallas International. I've never seen that many cars and people at Pensacola Airport in my life. I think everybody from all over the country is here. And uh, just praying that God will keep us safe uh, because the roads are absolutely packed. And people that aren't Christians, they're going to be driving. Wow. Celebrating, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. There are going to be a lot of intoxicated drivers on the road today, so I'm believing God's hand of mercy and grace of protection will be upon you. Before I preach this morning, I have a number of uh, special uh, requests to bring before you. Uh, Sister Helen Stewart's church has been shut down the last uh, three weeks. I just found that out a couple of days ago uh, at Brother... Uh, DL's camp meeting, there was some that uh, had the COVID there and that spread uh, just all over North Baldwin County and uh, a lot in her church uh, came down with it and this is the third different time that uh, they've had to shut down and uh, Brother Jerry's been uh, her husband, he's had Alzheimer's for some time and he's been struggling uh, in his body for quite a while just needs a miracle. Sister Helen's been trying to take care of him and then if you know her at all and you know she's trying to take care of everybody else in the church and their families that have been sick and uh, she was actually weeping on the phone when I talked to her just said I, I pondered resigning during all this just because I'm so physically weak and exhausted in my body. She said, but I had me a prayer meeting the other morning. God touched me and helped me, and I prayed through over it. So uh, that sounds just like her to me. But uh, just a, just an outstanding woman of faith. And uh, I want us to pray for her and her church family this morning. I remember those that are sick, and also remember Brother Jerry, her husband, and our prayers. And then uh, uh, Sister Chastain told me about... Uh, Brother Dalton Tate's mother, her name is Robin Phillips. Uh, she had a blockage in her kidney and uh, it caused her to go septic. And she is uh, in ICU on a ventilator, very much in need of a miracle this morning if she's gonna live. And uh, I watched God in revival, especially Friday night. I touched some people that were very sick in their body and uh, they shouted and jumped and rejoiced and said God healed them. And uh, I just know God to be a healer. Amen. Many of you lift your hand with me right now. Let's believe God for these that are in need of an absolute miracle in their body this morning. Father, we stand before you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do understand that there is sickness still spreading across our land. It has affected many of your people. God, in the way of COVID and other things, I pray God will touch them and their body. I pray you'll touch God pastors that are having to deal with it. God, in, in, in numbers that we've never seen before, I pray you'll give them supernatural strength. You'll, God, undergird the churches that are made to be shut down during this time, not just here in America, but God across the world. Some of the countries we support have been in lockdown still. While we've been enjoying liberty, they've been in lockdown. God, they stand in need of miracles this morning. Touch and heal. I pray, oh God, for Robin Phillips this morning. I ask you specifically for her and her body that you would work a miracle of healing. God, that you'd 
uh, remove the infection from that bloodstream. And God, that you'll heal those kidneys. God, that you'll raise her up, make her life a living testimony. And that she would praise you from her own lips, oh God. And give you glory for it all. We ask it together in Christ's holy and wonderful name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read this morning out of the book of St. Luke, chapter number 23. We're going to allow our children and our workers to be dismissed to Children's Church this morning. Appreciate them. Luke, chapter 23. Verse number Buddies like me is going to be last. <laughs> Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse number 13. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, or I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof you accuse him. No, nor yet hear it, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man and release unto us Barabbas who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil have he done? I have found no cause of death in it. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were and they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priest prevailed. Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. He released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the bearer and the wounds that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there, was, and there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding him. The rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. The superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. 
saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise? I want to preach to you on this thought, Calvary's three crosses. Yes. Calvary's three crosses. Father, we thank you for your word. I ask and pray again for your anointing upon the preached word of God. I'm nothing without you, but I can do all things by you and through you. I pray you'll touch me. Enable this feeble voice, O oh God, that's threadbare this morning. God, give it strength to preach one more time this morning. I pray, O oh God, that you'll meet us around this altar. God, that you'll grip hearts and lives. Uh, you'll save the lost. Uh, and, O oh God, you'll, we've already prayed, heal the sick. Yes. God, I pray today, a day of liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That you would rain down around this altar and fill us and refill us all. The glorious, magnificent gift and power of the Holy Ghost and yes. fire. God, that when we're able to leave, we'll be able to say it's been good for us to have been here. Grant it, we ask in Jesus' precious name. If you love the Lord, would you say amen? amen. Calvary's three crosses. <clears throat> I want us to look first again at verse number 39. One of the male factors which were hanged. This man was on one side of Jesus being hanged upon the same cross, not the same cross that Christ himself hung on, but he was hanged on a cross after the same manner as Christ and being hanged right next to him. The Bible said he railed on him. He railed upon Christ saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. It's one thing for the crowd to mock him. It's another thing for the uh, Romans to mock him. It was another thing for the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees to mock him because they were on the ground looking up. But can you imagine the audacity of one who is hanging on a cross, dying his own self a very brutal death, can you imagine the level of blasphemy it takes for that man to have railed upon Christ at Calvary? The amount of hopelessness that was hanging upon that cross blows my mind. And when I say hopelessness, if that is your attitude toward Christ on your deathbed, you have no hope. I looked up just out of curiosity in, in Strong's Concordance, the word railed, this man railed on him and to very little surprise and little shock because when you read that word, it almost jumps off the page that this man went out of his way to say something evil toward Christ because that word was only used here. He railed on him. It is the Greek word blasphemeo. Yeah. I don't have to tell you what that means. It's where we get our word blasphemy. To vilify. Especially to speak impiously. To speak blasphemous words. To defame. To revile. To speak evil of. He basically cursed him while he was hanging on the cross. Basically, his last dying words was to curse God and his son. You've met those kind of people, and so have I. This is the first cross of the three crosses of Calvary I want us to look at this morning. And we call this man's cross the cross of rejection. The cross of rejection. And it is a cross that men will bear. 
It is a cross that men will bear. If you die having rejected Christ, that will be your final end. Amen. If you die having not been born again because you refused to receive Christ, that will be the last say in your life. You will forever bear the cross of rejection. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26, a very famous text that many preachers use uh, to try to reinforce coming to church and not laying out for, you know, no reason. It says, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth, well, verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but all the more as we see the day approaching. Then verse 26 starts out saying, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law, that's the word of God, with, died without mercy, under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. Do you know the Holy Spirit here is called the Spirit of grace? The Holy Spirit comes to your heart when you are in sin, when you're living in a lukewarm or a backslidden condition, when you're in open rebellion against God, the Holy Ghost is not your enemy, but the Holy Ghost comes to you as the Spirit of grace. Now the Bible says that you are the enemy of God, but it doesn't mean that God is your enemy. That the whole time you spit blasphemy, the whole time you curse his name, the whole time you live in open rebellion, God is extending the hand of fellowship out toward you. He comes to you as the spirit of grace. But the Bible said that those that reject Christ, those that count the sacrifice of God's son on Calvary, the blood of the covenant as an unholy thing are spiting the spirit of grace. You are spitting in the face of the Son of God. You're spitting in the face of the Holy Ghost. And that in itself is an act of blasphemy. Yes. To look at Calvary and not be moved by it. To live in your sin knowing that Christ died to take away your sin and to save you is an act of rebellion, open rebellion. Yeah. It is railing on God. It is railing in the face of the Son of God. In Acts 24 and verse 22, read of a, of a man who is in eternity this morning and still having to bear the cross of rejection. His name is forever infamous as one who would not be saved, as one who is eternally lost and damned. In Acts 24 and 22, it reads, when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, what way? This gospel way, this Christian way. He deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down. I will know the uttermost of your matter. He commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, she was a Jew, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. Come judgment to come, every knee yeah. shall bow. Yeah. 
And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every one of us, uh, it says in the book of Romans, uh, will give an account uh, for what we've done in this body, whether it be good or bad. And he said, every one of us shall give an account of himself uh, unto God. There is a judgment to come. And when Felix heard it, uh, knowing that he was without remedy, knowing that he had not been born again, and that he was not a believer of this Christ that Paul was preaching, he was under extreme, heavy conviction. Uh, and his knees smote together, and he trembled at the preaching of the Word of God. And he answered, Go thy way. For this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money, there it is, there's your politician. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul that he might loose him. You know, if you'd give me enough money, I'd set you free and you wouldn't be in here. Paul's in there for preaching. Paul's already been told numerous times by prophecy through the voice of God that the Holy Ghost would, that you're going to stand before Caesar. You're going to give your testimony before Roman government dignitaries. My name's going to be praised and this gospel's going to be preached right at the head of the Roman government that was at that time the strongest, uh, most powerful known government in the world. God from the top uh, all the way to the bottom. I'll tell you the White House uh, is going to be judged uh, by this book right here. I tell the, you know, the, the nine Supreme Court justices uh, that uh, are, are, are appointed uh, to interpret the uh, the law of our land, the Constitution, I would say to him or to her, you just like Eddie Sullivan and every other pauper in the land are going to be judged by God's law. And unlike that Supreme Court that has become highly polit uh, or political, he's going to judge righteously. I want to tell you, if you're not born again, when that day comes, you're going to tremble. You're going to tremble just like Felix did. You're going to be made to bear the cross of rejection. He said he hoped that money would have been given him of Paul that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. He sent for him a lot of times. You want out? You ready to pay up? But he never found a convenient season to ever ask him again to preach to him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. That convenient season never came, and Felix and his Jew wife died lost, forever bearing the cross of rejection. In Mark 16 and 15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believes not this gospel shall be damned. Notice he didn't say he that believeth not uh, and he's not baptized. Baptism's irrelevant. Baptism's an act of obedience uh, after you're saved. There's no sense to mention, there's no sense in mentioning baptism if you don't believe. Right. I'd like to say if you don't believe, you ought not be baptized. Right. Right. Religion alone will never save you. Yes. Church right. membership alone will never save you. Right. Hey, being Brother Eddie's friend will never save you. Attending the church of your choice is not good enough. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? And if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're going to walk according to his commandment. You're going to live after his, you know, his, his precepts. 
You're going to walk in the Spirit. I found this story and found it to be absolutely astonishing. At the end of every presidential administration, you get all this, these lists of pardons. You know that's right, don't you? There's always a little bit of a debate over who gets pardoned. Some people find it, you know, astonishing that this one's did this and this administration pardoned them. How dare they? There's always that debate. But if you look at the list of men and the list of men that have been pardoned are too way too long to talk about. You would have to go back from George Washington all the way uh, now uh, through President Trump, which was 45 administrations. So you're talking about the 1700s, I believe 1776 until 2021. The list is far too long to even imagine reading. But do you know there's a very short list of men who receive pardon but refuse their pardon? Rejected their pardon. You know how long that list is? One man. 1829. Two men. George Wilson and James Porter. Robbed a mail carrier. Doesn't state what they took, but they robbed the U.S. mail carrier. Both were captured, tried in the court of law, and in May, they were in Philadelphia, by the way, in, in May of 1830, both men were found guilty of six charges, including robbery of the mail and putting the life of the mail carrier in jeopardy. Both Wilson and Porter received their sentences execution by hanging to be carried out on July the 2nd. Time sure had changed, have not You get the death penalty for robbing the mailman. Time sure have changed. Porter was executed on July the 2nd. His sentence was carried out, but Wilson's was not. His execution was stayed. Influential friends had pleaded for mercy to the President of the United States, who at the time was Andrew Jackson. President Jackson issued a formal pardon, dropping all charges. Wilson would have to serve only a prison term of 20 years for his other crimes. But incredibly, I'm reading the report. Incredibly, George Wilson refused his pardon. An official report stated Wilson chose to, this is official writings in uh, the law journals for the United States Supreme Court. The official report stated Wilson chose to waive and decline any advantage or protection which might be supposed to arise from the pardon. Wilson also stated he had nothing to say and did not wish in any manner to avail himself in order to avoid sentence. The U.S. Supreme Court determined the court cannot give the prisoner the benefit of the pardon unless he claims the benefit of it. Wow. It is a grant unto him. It is his property and he may accept it or deny it as he pleases. Chief Justice John Marshall wrote, a pardon is an act of grace proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws, but delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered, and we have no power in a court to force it upon him. He said a pardon is an act of grace by those who enforce the law, but we have no power to enforce the pardon upon him. It, is, it must be received of the one to whom it is given. 
George Wilson stands as the lone ranger, as the one man who was too proud, too prideful to accept mercy. The one man too proud to be pardoned of his penalty. You know what that name is symbolic of? Foolish. Yeah. Foolishness. Do you know what it would be to die lost? Foolish. That's right. And yet men and women do it every single day. They bear the cross of rejection and they do it Gladly. Oh, yeah. Second, I want us to view the cross that was on the other side. Beginning in verse 40, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? Seeing thou art in the same condemnation, he said, Hey, buddy, in case you haven't noticed, you're hanging on a cross. You've got nails in your hands and in your feet. You're dying. Yeah. Are you foolish or what? Don't you have any fear of God at all? He said, we indeed justly, meaning the condemnation placed upon them, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. The wages of sin is death. We received the due reward of our deeds, but this man had done nothing amiss. This man had no sin. This man has not been found guilty of anything. Apparently he was there. That in the, in the courtroom, in the sentencing stage, when Caesar said, I find no fault in this man. I've examined him. Herod's examined him. We've examined him one, two, three different times. And I'm telling you, we can find nothing, nowhere, at any time where this man has said or done anything that we could find him guilty of. Come on. But undoubtedly that the other two men, when their list of crimes was read off, guilty as charged. They've been tried, they've been found guilty, and they are worthy of death. Do you know what the law has come to do? The law is a schoolmaster that brings you to Christ. And you know what that term schoolmaster is a legal term. The law is a lawyer. The law is a prosecuting attorney. The law is a master that searches you out and convicts you and finds you guilty. Right. Guilty as charged. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. They are all together turned aside. All we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Right. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. Somebody in this house today that's never sinned against God, raise your hand quickly and say to God, I'm utterly holy. I've never one time broken your commandments. Nobody here can say it. We're all the recipients of God's mercy and God's grace. I want us to look at this second cross, and it is the cross of reception. As the first man refused pardon, as the first man refused to acknowledge Christ, as the first man, even on his deathbed, chose rather to curse God than to believe upon him. The second man said, Lord, I am guilty as charged. Lord, I'm, I've done things worthy of death. I'm not proud of it. But when you come into your kingdom, please remember me. 
It could rightly be worded without changing the text at all. When you come into your kingdom, Lord, please receive me. Receive me. I'm worthy of death, but I'm pleading your blood. I'm worthy of death, but I cry for your mercy. The word reception carries with it the definition, the act or action or an instance of receiving. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, will you please receive me? He acknowledged Christ as Lord. And the Bible said that no man can call Christ Lord but by the Holy Ghost. It was God the Father that had to reveal to that thief uh, hanging on the cross, this man next to you is indeed the Son of God. And if you would but believe upon him, put your faith in him, your hope in him, your trust in him, he and he alone is able to pardon your transgression, pardon your iniquity. I mean, George Wilson is under the death penalty. His friend, James Porter, has already been executed on July the 12th. Uh, and now, staring death in the face, uh, you, uh, uh, President Andrew Jackson has pardoned you. I refuse pardon. I don't want his help. Don't need his help. Uh, I got nothing to say to him or to you other than I don't want his pardon. He died a fool. Not this man. This man said, uh, I acknowledge uh, that's, the, that, that's the chief jury and executioner next to me. He and he alone has the authority and the power to save me and to pardon me from my transgression. Lord, I acknowledge you as my Lord. I acknowledge you as uh, God's only son. And I'm telling you, I'm worthy of death, uh, but have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sin. When you come into your kingdom, uh, remember me or receive me unto yourself. Christ looked at him. Christ didn't come, the Bible said, to condemn. Christ didn't come to prove the case that you were guilty. The Bible said uh, you're guilty and you know you're guilty. Your own life will bear it out when you stand before God on the day of judgment. Uh, Christ didn't come uh, to, to condemn you, but Christ come that uh, he might set you free. Christ came as your defense attorney and he said your only defense uh, is the mercy of the court. Yeah. Your only defense is the mercy of my Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but should have everlasting life. Your best defense is to plead guilty, confess your crime, and then beg for the court's forgiveness. Beg for the court's mercy. Yeah. Many a men have done the same thing in a legal court of law. And the law would go light or easy on them. But God is a just God. He rules in justice. He is absolutely fair. No man can say he made a plea bargain. He caught a deal and he got off too light. Uh, no, Christ paid the full penalty. Christ received uh, the death penalty in your place. Uh, God uh, cops no deals. Uh, he makes no plea bargains. Uh, he's got one deal. He's got one plea agreement. Uh, and that is you confess uh, my son is your Lord uh, and that his blood pardons you and sanctifies you and atoned for your crime against God's holiness. And then and only then will your sins be removed from you as far as the east is from the west. You ought to spend the rest of your days bearing the cross of reception. Lord, I want to thank you for who you are to me. I want to thank you for what you came to this earth to do. I want to thank you for mercy and grace. I will forever sing your praises. I will be nobody's fool. The spirit of antichrist that tries to make you Revel in sin. I won't play the devil's fool. I know where I am. I'm hanging on the other side. 
I'm hanging on the other side. Come on. I'm going to give an account to myself before God. I want to, if I got to bear a cross and we've all got our cross to bear, I want to be, I want to bear the cross of reception. Yes. Lord, I receive you Amen. as my Savior, Amen. as my Lord, yes. as my mercy, as my grace, as my Amen. pardon, Amen. as my holiness, as my righteousness, yes. as my lawyer. Hallelujah is my defense. I receive you and I praise, I praise you as such. He acknowledged Christ as Lord. He confessed that he was guilty of transgressions and worthy of death, and he asked the Lord to remember him, or better said, to receive him when he enters into his kingdom. He knew Christ alone could forgive and pardon and save him to repent of your sins and to acknowledge Christ as the only one who can save you and pardon your transgression is necessary on your part. John 17 and 2 says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That's Christ's ability. Yeah. He said again, this is Christ talking about his own self, his own office, the, mm -hmm. uh, office as the great high priest of God and as the Lamb of God. Thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. If Jesus and Jesus alone is able to pardon you, it would behoove you, sir. It would behoove you, ma'am. It would behoove you, young people. Look to Calvary. Look to Jesus and beg of his forgiveness. Don't die a fool. John 17 and 3, and this is, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Romans 6 and 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 5 and 13, these things I have written unto you that you might believe on the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life, and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. And last, I want us to behold the most beautiful cross of all. You're either, you and I, are going to bear the cross of the male factors. You're either going to bear the cross of rejection, or you're going to bear the cross of reception. But there was only one man worthy to bear that cross in the middle. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Is the cross most beautiful? It is the old rugged cross. Hallelujah. The cross of redemption. The cross of redemption. In Luke 23 and 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He said, I say unto thee that today I have redeemed you. Today, I've granted you pardon. Today, I'm washing you in my own blood. Today, I'm cleansing you from all of your sin. Today, I am absolving uh, your record. Uh, and today, I find in you no more guilt. Uh, today, I pronounce you holy and righteous uh, before God. Today, I have taken your crimes against humanity. They have been pinned upon my body. I will carry them into the tomb and bury them forever. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. That is redemption from a redeemer. John 3, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be Saved. I don't preach a message of condemnation to the lost. I just preach to the lost and tell them that without Christ, you yeah. cannot be saved. Look to Jesus. Don't die like George Wilson. Don't die 
bearing the cross of rejection. Look to Christ and his cross of redemption. Why would you bear the weight of your own cross when Christ hangs next to you upon his? Ephesians 1 and 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Woo! In whom I have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Colossians 1 and 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9 and 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then in verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. He's the one that draws the will and testament up, if you will, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, the law found you guilty, yeah. but a defense lawyer stood in your place uh, and bore the penalty on your behalf. Yeah. That they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yeah. The Bible said, who has washed us from our sin in his own blood. That's redemption. Mm -hmm. And as redeemed, we have been redeemed. We have been bought. Therefore, we are the servants of the Lord. As unrighteous, we were the servants of sin. Yeah, right. As being made righteous through Christ, we are now servants of the Lord. Amen. Yes. Servants of the Lord. I've been bought by him. A man bought a slave and he was bound to serve him. But Christ didn't love me like a bought slave. He did buy me. And I am the servant of the Lord, but as a servant that was bought, I'm now been adopted by the one who bought me and he loves me like a son yeah. and has made me an heir to the righteousness of God, which is by faith a joint heir with Jesus yeah. Christ, oh, yeah. his yeah. only begotten yeah. son. Yeah. He has loved me with the same love yeah. that he loved his own son. When he sees me, he sees me. Through the blood of the Lamb, he sees me as holy and not as I am. Yeah. Brother Mark Colley used to sing that and never failed to make tears stream down my face. When he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as holy and not as I am. Man, don't that make you want to shout glory? Hallelujah! It makes me want to shout praises yeah. under him this morning. Thank you, Lord. Come on, yes, Lord. You can't behold that cross of redemption without praise yeah. gushing up out of your spirit. Yeah. Heaven. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Up out of my spirit sings the choruses of amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Yeah. Oh. Save a wretch like me. Yeah. Curse if you'll help me, I'm finished this morning. You're able to stand with me this, this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Calvary's three crosses. Only Christ could have bore the cross of redemption. That was his cross and his alone to bear. He bore it. He did it gladly. But the two crosses you should also take a close look at this morning. With the male factors on either side of it. 
you're on one or the other. You're on the side of the cross of rejection or you're on the side of the cross of reception. What's it going to be for you this morning? Which side do you want to fall on this morning? You want your name to go down beside George Wilson? Want your name to go down beside Felix Agrippa? Want your name to go down next to Festus and his wife, Drusilla? You want your name to go down next to the likes of this man who cursed God with his last breath? railed on him while he was dying. Are you that foolish? If I were you today, I would look to Jesus. When John was caught up hither in Revelation chapter 4, come up hither and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. And he said, I beheld a lamb as he had been slain. He and he alone was worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Hallelujah. And he said, I saw round about him and round about the throne the four and the twenty elders and the four beasts. And they cast their crowns at his feet and said, Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for as a lamb thou wast slain and by thy blood hast thou redeemed us out of every tribe and kindred and tongue and nation and has made us kings and priests unto our God if I were you I'd fall in the company of that great host this morning I'd look to Jesus and his cross of redemption and I'd, I'd, if I was lost I'd say Lord have mercy on me I am a hell-bound sinner. I've committed enough sin to be cast into hell 10 million times over again, and I am worthy of death, but I plead the blood of Jesus who was sent not to prosecute me, but who was sent to save me. Please save me. That would be my prayer of urgency this morning. And if you're born again, I will tell you to look back at that same cross this morning and throw your grateful hands up to Christ in adoration and say praise unto him who by his blood has redeemed me out of every tribe, kindred, tongue, and nations of all the world. He redeemed me. Lowly and simple me. And has made me a king and a priest unto my God. I'm going to live out my life as a king and priest unto God. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to be subject unto him. I'm going to live according to his word. And I'm going to praise him. I'll be his ambassador. I want to let everybody know who he is and what he's done. And what he'll do for them. Would you meet me in this altar this morning? Lift up holy hands and let's love him. Let's worship him. Let's praise him. It's still early, you got time. We'll have food in the back.